Nick Majerison here. Welcome to Top Med Talk. Thanks for downloading the podcast. If you're enjoying what you hear, do make sure you've subscribed. This week, we're presenting to you our Extreme Everest mini-series, which we streamed on the website live from Duke University in America on June the 14th and the 15th when these presentations first took place. Today's talk is entitled Oxygen Therapy, the yin and yang of our favourite drug. It's presented by Professor Monty Mython. Top Bird Talk. Thank you very much indeed. What a pleasure it is to be parachuted in amongst all these really clever people to give you a personal reflection on where I think we are with the therapeutic use of oxygen, or at least the therapeutic manipulation of oxygen, which I think it comes in two different guises. One is the manipulation of oxygen flux, and the other one is the manipulation of arterial oxygen tension. And I think there's different messages associated with the manipulation of oxygen in both of those ways. And it is a yin and a yang. Some potential conflicts of interest. So, a bit of personal reflection. Some of us in the room, looking at a very small number of people here, intermittently, remember the heady days of the introduction of the pulmonary artery catheter, and in particular from it making a transition from something that was used by cardiologists to measure heart pressures to something that we thought opened up this brave new world of understanding cardiac output at the bedside. So the pulmonary artery flotation catheter, I first walked onto an intensive care unit over 35 years ago, and our senior resident there every few weeks would make a decree that we would get out the pulmonary artery catheter, and we would put it in a patient, and using intermittent boluses of cold fluid, we would try and make determinations of cardiac output with the support of a very clunky computer. By the time I arrived here in 19, the late 1990s, uh, pulmonary artery catheters for cardiothoracic surgery and for many elements of intensive care, particularly surgical intensive care, were ubiquitous. They'd made a transition into being um, continuous using an alternative thermodilation method and including mixed venous oxygen saturations. So when I first arrived on the SICU as one of the four attendings there in 1995, uh, along with um, Rob Slade and Jerry Reeves and joined by Steve Vasleff, this was a common thing that was told to people. So if a patient was going off in the middle of the night, you'd hear the senior resident turn around to the junior resident and say, swan them, swan them up and do the D dot V dot thang, which <laughs> I didn't have a clue what they were talking about, but I thought, <laughs> jolly good, carry on, is what I thought, you know, very good. And what they would do is insert a pulmonary artery catheter and then manipulate preload, afterload, contractility to try and achieve a magic number of oxygen delivery with the hope that by increasing oxygen flux, that critically ill patient would recover from their critical illness and everything would get better. Around the same time, 1994, so a year before I arrived here, much of the world was beginning to go off that idea in the critically ill. This was the first of a series of attempts to try and determine if that idea that was taken from major elective surgery, the increase in oxygen flux, DO2, oxygen consumption to predetermined levels associated with survivors would improve outcome in critical illness. And this particular article from London, from Michel Hayes and colleagues, relatively small by modern standards, looked at that idea and indeed using a pulmonary artery catheter and what we would now regard as heroic, perhaps uh, inappropriately high doses of dobutamine, but those that were recommended at the time, they demonstrated as shown here that they could indeed drive oxygen delivery up to above the magic number of 600 mils per minute per meter squared. So the dark circles here at the top, the intervention patients, the white circles, those who just had regular care, settling out with a DO2 of around 550, but normally under the 600. Now of note, and this overlaps very much with the data that Denny Levitt showed about humans adapting to hypoxia, in other words, that the VO2 max, the maximal oxygen consumption in human beings at altitude goes down and down and down, we seem to be unable to manipulate oxygen consumption. So these are the same patients, and although they've driven up the patients in the black dots to a supramaximal DO2 oxygen delivery, the VO2 has not budged. And the VO2 is a long way below the target VO2, and interestingly on reflection, the magnitude of difference is not dissimilar to what Denny described in human beings adapting to hypoxia. 
So something had switched off the metabolism and it wouldn't budge. Very disturbing from this prospective randomized controlled trial, the attempts to drive up DO2 dramatically increased mortality. So just to say that again, the attempts to drive up DO2 dramatically increased mortality. Now, subsequent follow-up studies did not demonstrate with lower doses of dobutamine the same increase in mortality, but none of them in established critical illness ever demonstrated any benefit. So that's where we were. Now, around the same time, many of us involved in laboratory research, which is what I was doing some of at the time, this is taken from a model where we're looking at gut mucosal perfusion, work that I did over here at Duke as well back in the late 1990s in Bruce Leone's laboratory, taking samples here of the microvillus before and after an ischemia reperfusion injury and looking at the integrity of the tissues, which looked okay to the naked eye and looked kind of all right under light microscopy. But when you subjected them to electron microscopy, the image you can see on the right-hand side is a microvillus that has undergone significant cell death and there's been loss of the mucosal membrane. If you look on the left, the vessels are patent and the cells look healthy. If you look on the right, you've lost the microcirculatory perfusion and the cells have either undergone necrosis, probably not, or more likely apoptosis, programmed cell death, and then some degree of autophagy, natural digestion of oneself, to reduce the cell mass possibly, but also in these types of tissues to turn around and say, well, actually, if I'm now under threat of dying from critical illness, do I need a GI tract that's there to absorb food and possibly inadvertently absorb bugs? Or would I rather turn that into a featureless tube and reduce the energy requirements of absorbing nutrients and I can't use? So we're all starting to think a bit differently at this time. Again, in parallel, people were starting to notice making early, relatively crude microcirculatory measures, and this was referred to earlier gastric tonometry, for example, as a surrogate for tissue metabolism, that when you admitted patients in sepsis, severe sepsis, with evolving multiple organ failure, that you could drive up the oxygen delivery, shown in the white bars here from 500 to 700 mils per minute per meter squared, but the measure of tissue perfusion you could not budge. So the microcirculatory changes, which we can now visualize with the sort of things that Dan's shown you, we now understand that that happens. The microcirculation becomes sluggish in response to a depression of cellular metabolism. The next thing that happened in the story was that the measurement of cardiac output became a lot easier. So whether it be the advent of transesophageal echo, transthoracic echocardiography, or bedside monitors of cardiac output not dependent on the pulmonary artery catheter, the ability to measure cardiac output and oxygen flux became very easy. So this example is the esophageal Doppler. It's a stripped down transesophageal echo. It's been around for 30 plus years now. Place it into the esophagus, insinate the descending aorta, generate a velocity time envelope, Look at the integral of that, gives you stroke distance, you've got a surrogate for cardiac output. When we applied those technologies in small studies starting in the 1990s to patients undergoing elective major surgery, now the big difference here is it's elective major surgery. So putting it very crudely, we're starting with fresh meat. And what we're trying to do is to keep fresh meat fresh rather than the critical ill situation where the meat is going off and we're trying to freshen it up again, rather than waiting for nature to take its course. So if those thoughts are disturbing to anyone, but you get the point here. So in major surgery, if we manipulated cardiac output, measuring it with these relatively non-invasive measures, simply by the administration of the right amount of fluid, we enabled oxygen flux to increase to the maximum it could do without driving it. So we enabled the cells to draw upon the oxygen flux by giving the right amount of fluid, cardiac output and DO2 went up. When we, and by we I mean the broader scientific community, I'm not saying that I did this, I did actually do this one, but I didn't do all of it. We could show that we could mitigate the loss of tissue hypoperfusion by maintaining central volume, therefore maintaining cardiac output, therefore enabling DO2 to respond to VO2. So we were allowing the heart to meet the demands of the tissues by maintaining appropriate central blood volume. If we didn't do that, which was more common practice, then in half the patients, tissue hypoperfusion prevailed and they did not have the ability to match DO2 to VO2. 
And those early observations, of which we've now seen tens of trials of this over the decades, although they were only powered initially to be mechanistic, very small trials, those manipulations were associated with very dramatic improvements in outcome. So as you might expect, the maintenance of oxygen flux by simple measures such as giving the right amount of fluid kept the meat fresh. So the patients avoided tissue hypoperfusion and didn't go on to develop multiple organ failure. Nice idea. So that was the 1990s. Let's jump forward to 2015. I'm a critical care doc. So us critical care docs a little bit disturbed by the fact that our endeavours previously to recover critical illness by manipulating oxygen flux, for which we became quite depressed for a few decades about that, were reinvigorated by the concept of early goal-directed resuscitation. So the idea based on a single centre trial from the USA that if we got down to the emergency room and we grabbed people as they came in through the door, which might represent those people who have still not lost that end organ perfusion, that we might be able to manipulate oxygen flux using the things that had failed before to make the world a better place. And you all know the result of that story. Eventually, after a decade or so of people being enthusiastic for it, it was subjected to three large multi-center prospective randomized controlled trials. One led from the USA, one led from the UK, Europe, one led from Australia, New Zealand, they all independently adequately powered and concluded that those endeavours made no difference to long-term survival. So no harm this time, no suggestion of harm, but no suggestion of additional benefits in terms of survival by manipulating oxygen flux in this idea of early sepsis. Now on reflection, you know, what's early sepsis? Do you suddenly wake up one day and say, oh, I'm feeling a bit septic at the moment. I better pop down to the emergency department because if you don't hyper-resuscitate me in the six, next six hours, I'll probably develop multiple organ failure. You're probably unwell, typically, unless you're hit by a truck or something for a number of hours, possibly days, maybe even weeks before you get to the emergency department. And maybe you're already on the route to making successful adaptation to allow you to survive long time. And maybe as you're making that adaptation, what you don't want is to someone to drive up your oxygen delivery because you're trying to drive down your VO2 as part of your survival mechanism. Yet to be determined. Around the same time, 2014, we're now a long, long, long way into this idea of manipulating oxygen flux in elective major surgery. There is the largest prospective randomized control trial to date published, led by Rupert Pierce out of the United Kingdom, multi-center trial, where in around 700 patients, they've deliberately manipulated oxygen flux in those elective surgical patients. And the result is absolutely tantalizing. So the primary outcome variable was complication or deaths within 30 days. The relative risk difference between the two is about 16% in favor of the intervention. The absolute difference is close to about 8%. But because we live by the p-value, the p-value is 0 0.070, so we say that that 16% relative difference in favor of the intervention means that there is no difference. Now, if you're not a physician in the room who does this sort of thing and you're given a choice between the two, I challenge you to say which one of these groups you'd rather be in having major surgery, particularly when you look out at the six-month survival. So this is six months later. The solid line is the cumulative mortality for the intervention group. The dotted line is the usual care group. And again, the relative reduction in risk in terms of mortality at six months is a 14% difference. But again, because of the Statistical methodology that was chosen, the p-value is 0.09, so our conclusion is there is no difference between those two groups. There is a, a story, I wasn't there, that apparently when the statistician broke the code for this and looked at the results, he said, I know you're all obsessed with this p-value, but if I'm ever subjected to this, could I please be in the intervention group? Because you know, it, looks, it looks very different to me. Now, there was a follow-up from the, America, the ASA, the other ASA, the American Statistics Association, there's a dissertation you can find online, that if they'd subjected this to Bayesian analysis, the p-value would have been less than 0.001, and we would be saying it works. Also, interestingly, if a priori they decided to eliminate the learning stage of the first few patients in each center, it would have been statistically significant. But that's not the way we do this. So let's subject that to meta-analysis. This is Professor Grocott's work with Rupert Pierce. 
At the request of JAMA, they put the results of that trial back into the previous trials in a systematic review. And the conclusion is that it looks interesting. In favour of the intervention with a p-value of less than 0.001, it looks like it may work. So, I don't know if this is the good news or the bad news, but the largest ever trial, which is now up to thousands of patients, is ongoing. It's an international multi-centre trial led by Professor Rupert Pierce to see if the manipulation of oxygen flux by the administration of fluid Inotropic agents, possibly red blood cells, improves outcome in elective major surgery. And I'm hoping before it's my turn to be subjected to this, we'll have an answer to this question. Because I'd rather die knowing the answer to it rather than die from not knowing the answer to it, if you get my point. So the key message there, as far as I can see, which has been referred to repeatedly, is there are phases here. It looks hopeful that the manipulation of oxygen flux may keep patients who are previously fit and well in that state if you do it sensibly and gently proportionally. If you wait until someone has chronic illness and they've possibly entered the acclimatization or hibernation phase of their critical illness, then driving up their oxygen delivery may put the brakes on them continuing to adapt and survive and may actually be damaging in the way that Hayes et al. demonstrated in 1994. And that kind of makes sense. So the challenge is, how do we work out where people are? It's easy for elective major surgery, but how do we work out after that where they are in that transition from fight or flight to hibernating? That then brings us to the manipulation of supplemental oxygen and changing oxygen tension. So one of our favorite drugs, along with IV fluids, is the administration of supplementary oxygen. If you're in an acute hospital setting, it's nigh on impossible to not have an IV running and to have an oxygen mask or some nasal prongs on you to drive up your oxygen to supranormal levels. Both fundamentally unproven therapeutic interventions that we spend massive for healthcare dollars on that both increasingly have suggestions that they may be causing more harm than good. That's a little bit disturbing, isn't it? We've kind of got used to them always being there, so we don't ask difficult questions. An editorial from Dan Martin and Mike Grocott in the anesthesia context commenting on the yin and yang of oxygen supplementation. Because there have been a number of trials, this is going back to the so-called proxy randomized controlled trials, that deliberately gave 80% supplementary oxygen post-operatively compared to 30% to look at the impact of surgical site infections in a few hundred patients, disappointingly finding no impact on surgical site infection, but rather disturbingly demonstrating quite a trend to an increase in 30-day mortality in the patients who received 80% rather than 30% oxygen, 4.4 versus 2.9%. Hmm, that's a little bit worrying. Then a subset analysis looking at the overall impact, so the likelihood of survival is reduced by supplementary oxygen. If you break out the patients by elective cancer surgery patients or non-cancer surgery patients, there's no difference for the non-cancer surgery, but there's quite a dramatic difference for the cancer surgery. Then there are a number of observational studies, a Cochrane review of oxygen versus air following myocardial infarction, accepting it's observational, but you're three times more likely to die if you received supplementary oxygen rather than air. Another study here looking at cardiac arrest and in-hospital mortality, much more likely to die in observational studies if you're rendered hyperoxic by supplementary oxygen. Then one of the most recent, rather than sensational, it's a small trial, but with a dramatic result, titled The Effect of Conservative Versus Conventional Oxygen Therapy on Mortality Among Patients in an Intensive Care Unit, published in JAMA in 2016, suggesting that whatever this conservative is, and you, know, you need to read this closely, it's not clear how conservative it is, and it's not clear how conventional the other group is, but the lower oxygen group had almost half the mortality than the conventional oxygen group. So that's prompted many people around the world to now be engaged in trials to try and answer this fundamental question, you know, is less more? And certainly is hyperoxia potentially harmful, or as you'll hear later on in certain circumstances, possibly beneficial, but does it depend on where you are in the phase of your uh, illness? That's the survival curves for that trial. So to close, that is the most recent systematic review that I could find. 
Uh, I think they found in here about 35 trials in four subset areas of which 31 were analyzable and in 30 of them, whether it be trauma, acute brain injury, stroke, myocardial infarction, hyperoxia was associated with significant harm in 30 of the trials and in one of the trials there was a glimmer of hope that increasing oxygen levels of supplementary oxygen might not be as bad uh, as the other way around, but 30 out of the 31 suggested harm. So oxygen, our favourite molecule in many ways, but like everything in life there is a yin and a yang and a little bit of what you like is probably good for you, but too much is almost never the right plan. Thank you for listening. Top Med Talk. Don't forget you can meet the Top Med Talk team, edpom.org forward slash meetings. Our next big event takes place between the 28th and the 30th of September. Edpom USA Chicago Masters course, a perioptive care practicum.